Hey everyone, it's Sarah with RegisterNurseRN.com and in this video I'm going to be going over Tetralogy of Fallot. And this video is part of an NCLEX review series over pediatric nursing. And as always, after you watch this YouTube video, you can access the free quiz that will test you on this condition. So let's get started. What is Tetralogy of Fallot? It is a congenital heart defect that is characterized by four structural defects of the heart. Now some quick facts about Tetralogy of Fallot is that it is one of the most common complex congenital heart defects. And it occurs whenever the baby is developing in its mother's womb. So some parts of the heart do not form correctly. And according to the CDC.gov, in every 2,518 births, one baby in the U.S. will be born with this condition. And it's known as a cyanotic heart defect, which means that there is going to be decreased pulmonary blood flow going to the lungs so that blood can become oxygenated. So in other words, that baby or child is not gonna be receiving nice oxygenated blood, which is going to cause the organs, the tissues to suffer so they can have this bluish type tint to them called cyanosis. Now to easily understand tetralogy of flow, you'll want to know the basic anatomy of the heart and how the blood normally flows through it. Because as you're studying all those other congenital heart defects, it's just gonna make sense and there's really not a lot of memorizing you have to do it because once you can see how that blood flows, you're gonna see, okay, I see why this person's having these signs and symptoms and what's going on. So first let me cover the normal blood flow through the heart and then we're gonna compare it to a person who has tetralogy of flow and talk about these different structural defects. Okay, so how I like to look at blood flow is I like to divide it up into two parts. We have the right side of the heart and we have the left side of the heart and everything starts in the right side of the heart. Now the goal of the right side of the heart is to take that unoxygenated blood, that exhausted blood that your body just used up and get it to the lungs so we can get oxygenated. Then it'll come to the left side of the heart and the goal of the left side of the heart is to take that nice rich oxygenated blood and get it to your organs and your tissues because your body wants real oxygenated blood. It doesn't want this mixing of unoxygenated with oxygenated. It just doesn't work and it doesn't like that. Okay, so your body has used up this blood. It's gonna drain it back through the superior and inferior vena cava. Hence, it's represented in blue. It's unoxygenated. At first, it's gonna flow down through the right atrium. Then the blood as this valve right here, which is called the tricuspid valve, it's gonna open up and let it flow down through the right ventricle. Now, you have the tricuspid valve and the bicuspid valve. Tricuspid valve is on the right side of the heart and the bicuspid valve, which is also called the mitral valve, is on the left side of the heart. Don't let the two confuse you. How I remember it is the little saying, try before you buy. So try, tricuspid, buy, bicuspid over here. So the right ventricle, heart's gonna contract. It's going to squeeze and pump that unoxygenated blood up through the pulmonic valve, then through the pulmonary artery, which is gonna to go to the lungs. And you have capillary beds on your alveoli sacs and oxygen that you just inhaled is gonna cross over into this blood and carbon dioxide is going to cross over for you to exhale and that blood is going to be replenished again with oxygen. So nice oxygenated blood then is going to go into the left side of the heart through the pulmonary vein. Then it's gonna go down through the left atrium, down through the bicuspid valve, which is the mitral valve. Then to the left ventricle, it's almost to the body. Then it's gonna get squeezed up, and if we could see behind this area, you would see part of the aorta. It's gonna go up through the aortic valve, be squeezed up through there, and then into the aorta, and then shot throughout the body. And it's gonna replenish those organs and tissues. However, with Tetralogy of Fallot, this is not how the heart is set up. There are structural defects, which is gonna alter the way that the blood flows. And like I said at the beginning of the lecture, how many structural defects are there? There's gonna be four. And to help us remember those, let's remember the word wraps. Okay, this person is going to have R for right ventricular hypertrophy. They're gonna have A for aorta displacement, 
P for pulmonary stenosis, and then S for a septal defect, specifically a ventricle septal defect. So let's look at it. Okay, here we have our heart. Let's go through just like how the blood should flow and talk about what's happening. Okay, so with these patients, blood's gonna flow in the normal way. Everything starts at the right side. So superior inferior vena cava is bringing that exhausted, unoxygenated blood to the right side of the heart, which is trying to get it to the lungs to get it oxygenated. So it's gonna go down through the right atrium, down through the tricuspid valve, and then down through the right ventricle. This is where our problem begins. Okay, normally, in our last picture, if you notice, the right and left ventricle was separated by like a septal wall because we shouldn't have our blood that goes into our right ventricle and our left ventricle to mix. But unfortunately, we have a septal wall defect. So there's gonna be this big hole right here allowing this blood to mix together. Now, our problem continues. What did I say that the right ventricle does? Whenever it receives its blood, it squeezes it up through the pulmonic valve, through the pulmonary artery to get to the lungs. Ain't happening here because our pulmonic valve is going to be stenosed. It's going to be real narrow and that artery is going to be really narrow. So the right ventricle isn't going to be able to successfully pump that unoxygenated blood to the lung. So you're gonna have decreased pulmonary blood flow. So you're not gonna get a lot of blood that's becoming oxygenated. So we have pulmonary stenosis. Now that's gonna to lead to another issue. That right ventricle has to pump against so much resistance against that narrow pulmonary valve artery. What happens to a muscle when you give it so much resistance? It starts to enlarge. So that's what happens, right ventricular hypertrophy. So our right ventricle is going to enlarge instead of being normal size. So another thing, because we have four problems, this aorta, we're gonna have aorta displacement. So here we have the aortic valve. On our other drawing, it was nice up here, wasn't enlarged. But here with these patients, it's enlarged. And what happens is that this moves the aorta. And unfortunately, what happens is that it moves the aorta right over this septal wall defect opening. So as you can see, you have this unoxygenated blood that's mixing with this oxygenated blood together and it's getting in a sense sucked up through the aorta and it's going throughout the body. So this person's receiving all this unoxygenated blood that way. And the right side of the heart is limited in how much blood it can get to the lungs to become oxygenated because this pulmonic art, um, artery and valve is so narrow. So really it's all just going up through this area. So you have what's called a right to left shunt. All the blood from the right is being shunted over here and just going up through the aorta and it's unoxygenated blood. Now let's talk about the signs and symptoms that you can see in these patients who have tetralogy of flow. And to help us remember those signs and symptoms, let's remember the word afflict. Now we know all these signs and symptoms are gonna go along with that decreased pulmonary blood flow because that blood is not being able to be oxygenated and go to the organs and tissues. So our signs and symptoms are really gonna correlate with that. So be thinking in that realm. So A for activity. Any activity that this patient does, we're talking about children, babies, like crying, they're feeding, they're playing, it's gonna put a lot of stress and demand on that heart. And as we just seen, the structural defects don't allow the heart to be able to work correctly under those type of conditions. So it can't replenish the blood with oxygen. So any type of activity can stress the heart out, leading to what's called a tet spell. If you can't remember anything about tetralogy of flow, remember tet spell and need to chest position or squatting. Just remember that because it's the big takeaways from this lecture for your exams. So they have these tet spells and this is where they start to become cyanotic, that skin will have a bluish tint, shortness of breath, increased respiratory rate. And here in a moment, we'll talk about your role during a tet spell. F or fingernail changes, which will represent clubbing of the nails. And this is from where they have chronic hypoxia, that 
chronic low oxygen in the blood causes those nails to have an abnormal appearance, which is similar to these image, this image right here. And as the nurse, you may notice this around six months of age in your patients. Our next F for fatigue slash faints easily. And again, this is related to those chronic low oxygen levels. And especially during a TET spell, the patient can faint. So you'll want to be aware of that. We don't really want them to get to that point. So whenever you're thinking of your plan of care for this patient, nursing diagnosis, a great one would be activity intolerance. Patients who have this can't do the normal things like other children can. So in your plan of care, you would want to make sure your nursing interventions and your goal, goals for those patients are appropriate. Okay, L for lift knee to chest position or squat, squatting. And notice I have three asterisks by that because I really want you to remember this. So anytime a patient is having a test spell, what you want to do, say you get a test question that says, you're feeding an infant with tetralogy of flow. You notice while you're feeding the infant, they start, their skin starts to turn like a bluish color and their respiratory rate has increased. What's your next, next nursing action? Well, this is a TET spell, so you'll be thinking in that realm. What you'd want to do is stop feeding that infant and put them in the knee to chest position, give them oxygen, and calm them. Some physicians may order medications to help keep the infant calm or IV fluids. Now, why IV fluids? Well, IV fluids can help decrease that right to left shunt, which ties it in with the squatting. Some parents may ask you, you know, my kid, two, one and a half, they notice whenever they're playing with others, all of a sudden they'll just squat. Why are they squatting? What's the purpose of that? Well, it goes along with the knee to chest position and the squatting IV fluids. It helps. What it does is it increases systemic vascular resistance. And whenever you have that, what that's going to do is that's going to decrease that right to left shunting, which is going to help improve blood flow and help increase the oxygen level. So that is what that is doing, which is really neat that the child just in a sense naturally knows just to squat to do that. So that's the purpose of that. And if you see that again, you'll know. Okay, I for inability to grow. These patients will usually be smaller for their age. And again, it's just tying back to our body. Whenever a child is growing, they need oxygen to grow to their tissues, their bones, everything like that. So they'll have the inability to grow right. C for cardiac sounds. These patients are gonna have abnormal cardiac sounds. What are you gonna hear? One thing you can hear is a harsh systolic murmur and you could feel a systolic thrill. Now, where are you going to hear this murmur? Well, where is it coming from? What's causing it? Remember the pulmonic valve? is stenose, it's narrow. So you're gonna hear it where you would hear your pulmonic valve, which think back to health assessment. Where do you hear that pulmonic valve? You hear it at the left of the sternal border at that second intercostal space. So a harsh systolic murmur and it's from pulmonary stenosis. And then T, or last part of our mnemonic, trouble feeding and thriving. So these patients, another nursing diagnosis, some of these patients could have is failure to thrive because of what's going on with the oxygen levels. So they can have low weights because they're not growing, they'll be small for their age, and they will have a decrease in meeting their developmental milestones compared to their peers. Now let's quickly go over the treatment for this condition. Okay, this condition requires surgery to fix these structural defects. Now cases vary of tetralogy of flow. Some patients have very severe cases with worst case scenarios, so it'll vary on what each patient will get. But they can have a temporary surgery, which is like a palliative surgery, until they can have complete surgery whenever they're really young. And a shunt can be placed to shunt blood. So you're increasing the pulmonary blood flow to the lungs. Or a stent can be placed to open up that narrowing of the pulmonary artery and the pulmonic valve to help increase the pulmonary blood flow. Then a complete repair can be done. This is usually around six to 12 months of age whenever the child's a little bit older and they can place a patch to correct the VSD, that ventricular septal defect. Because remember, we don't want the blood mixing here. So they can place a patch here to prevent that blood from mixing together. 
Now, one drug I want to point out to you, just so you can be familiar with it, is called alprostadil, which is a prostaglandin E medication. And what this medication does is it keeps the ductus arteriosum open. And we're talking about newborn babies here. A lot of times, babies who are born with tetralogy of flow, if they have a major defect to that pulmonary valve where they are literally just not getting any blood flow, to those lungs, we're gonna have issues. They're gonna have like major cyanosis at birth. And they can be started on this infu infusion. And what it's gonna do is it's gonna keep this ductus arteriosum open because after birth, normally, that will close shortly after birth. So we don't want to close in this condition because what it can do, it's normally about right here, it allow blood to flow into this pulmonary artery which is gonna increase blood flow to the lungs and we can get more hopefully oxygenated blood throughout the body. So just be familiar with that drug and patients who receive that will get that as an infusion and then they can have a temporary surgery until they're old enough to have complete repair. Okay, so that wraps up this review over Tetralogy of Flow. Thank you so much for watching. Don't forget to take the free quiz and to subscribe to our channel for more videos.